Welcome at the DIFF, the online festival of ideas that asks the question, what if you could redesign everything? And here in the live studio today, um, I have two guests that will explore the, um, about how to design for positive impact. And the first guest of today is Jan Lysens. He is the founder of the circular business design agency, Regenerative Design. And he believes that you can't make sustainability into a positive story if your main focus is on negative impact. His goal is to develop systems that are able to have strong impact on the short term and will guide society towards a more sustainable, social and economically different system in the long term. The second guest of today is the industrial designer Kasper van der Meer. He is co-founder of the product design studio Better Future Factory. He believes in tangible solutions to drive positive impact. The Better Future Factory helps companies to turn their waste streams into new high quality products and materials with scalability and the circular economy framework in mind. I just want to give you all a heads up um, about the following. You can post all your questions on Twitter using um, hashtag thinkdiff. And you can also leave your questions and comments on the session page if you log into your MyDiff account. You can do this for free. Um, so welcome, Kasper. Welcome, Jan. Um, you. Welcome to our live studio. Um, just to kick off with the first question um, uh, to you, Kasper. Um, we are talking about how to design for positive impact. Are we currently designing for a negative impact? <laughs> I think we're doing our best to design for positive in uh, impact. Um, and it's, I think that's, I agree in that we should, we should focus on the positive for the better future. Uh, and that's, that's also, I think, the, the way we work. So you can be against the system, but I think what we try to do with our company is that we, we would like to work with the current system and then create a better future. And you are uh, a hub for other companies to um, to grow, right? You you host other companies in the Better Future Factory too. Yeah, yeah, we work together with companies closely in sort of a co-creation process. Um, next to that, uh, that we also do um, projects together with clients. We also initiate our own projects. So if we think something is worthwhile pursuing, or we think um, yeah, this needs to be further further investigated. Um, we do projects on our own and sometimes they grow into individual startups. Yeah. And um, you have your own uh, design agency, Regenerative yep. Design. Um, why should we design for a positive? Well, I think if we talk about sustainability right now, we're focusing mainly on reducing negative impact and then we're surprised that nobody gets enthusiastic about that. So I think turning that into how can we create something that makes sense that we all want to join into and that feels like something bigger than just reducing negative impact and sustainability beyond the ability to sustain beyond just not dying, I think is, is crucially important to make mm -hmm. it work. Yeah, and especially I think the part of, of joining is a, yeah. a really an yeah. important aspect. So it becomes something that that's, has the interest of a, a lot of people, not only the highly educated or the, or the people that are already doing a lot about sustainability, but it should be something um, Something neutral, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, and you talk about the, the role of designers changing from, from um, content-driven to context-driven. Uh, what do you mean with that? Well, I think that for a very long time, and, and even up until this day, we have been teaching students how to become star designers or, or star architects or whatever. And, and, and you put your ego first and your product second. And your product is basically just to show off what you can and can't do. And I think that uh, sustainability and social innovation is way too complex to consider yourself as the only person who's capable of bringing something relevant to the table. So what you should do, I think, as a designer at this point is creating a context where you bring in all the different trends and hypes that are changing right now our society and let people put their own experience and their own thoughts into that and then be a, an observer. And, and put yourself at service of the design and then see what emerges from that. And that, that process is more the design than the result of it. The result is just you're, you're always in beta. So, so what do designers then actually do? Ask questions, I think. I think designers ask, should ask the right questions. That's the, that's the essence of good design. Yeah, and I, th I also think there's sort of a, a bridge between, on one hand, um, production, and the other hand, maybe art. So sort of bring yeah. them together. So that yeah. I think 
designers are also sort of a communication yeah, tool absolutely. between different um, um, industries, absolutely. industries, uh, but also the consumer. Um, and, so and you use the technologies and the tools and, and, and the, the, the process of prototyping to show possible futures and possible solutions on the questions you're asking on the, the input you're getting. So you're using stuff like products and stuff like uh, prototyping tools to show a tangible version so it becomes more than just the idea because ideas are, are too cheap and everyone can, has, can have ideas. But you use the, the, the skill to materialize stuff to show that it's feasible and show what the opportunities are that lie within those ideas. Yeah, and I also think like designers have a, a certain responsibility if you compare it to other um, industries that because they're always really on the on the forefront of, of innovation, they also have a re responsibility to be more aware about sustainability, circular economy, whatever you want to call it. But they have a res responsibility to give sort of the good example uh, because they're much more aware of these things than I think other disciplines. And, and do you think that that responsibility is always taken? No, not always. Because no, you also, don't. I was talking to um, uh, Colin from the Diff team, and he um, told me about like um, a toy that his kid got in a in a Happy Meal, um, mm. you know, in that package where you have like this plastic thing. Like, there's also a designer designing that Happy yeah. Meal that yeah. will be disposed probably within a few hours. Mm. Um, so, so do you think that that is do is that the the role of the designer is that taking that responsibility? Or is that just the wider, like the production team? It's also a company behind it, and the person that creates the design brief that hires the designer, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. what is the role of the designer specifically? Now, if you, for example, look at these toys, um, what could be a responsibility of the designer in this way is that he at least looks at the product that can be recycled later on, or that it can be put back in a certain certain system, um, because it's definitely designed as kind of a disposable toy and yeah, it's I think only fun for um, maybe about a week and then it, then it gets uh, disposed so the designer in, in this case should think of it as a, as a material that could be used again uh, and brought back into a certain system for recycling so that's I think that's a clear role in that case for a designer. Exploring also different business models or different ways of implementing it? Um, yeah, well, I think if you look at organization like bigger organizations it's all, yeah, sometimes a bit difficult to go that far um, but, for example, in smaller companies or startups, it's definitely something the designer should also be aware of. I think also, like, like you said, uh, the, the person writing out the design brief, I think the, the, the first role in any design process is, is ripping the design brief and, and asking why are you asking me this design and then from there build up again a new idea. And so if you get the, the design brief to create a, a throwaway toy made of cheap plastics that can be mass produced, your first question is, should we do this? Is this what is going to create the big edge in, in McDonald's that people keep coming to us uh, instead of to another uh, fast food? And, and do you think that also for, because we have, like our div audience consists of a lot of different types of designers as well, also businesses and people that are interested in mm. design, but there must be also some in-house designers working for a company that get design briefs that they need to deliver. Um, do you think that there is also freedom for them to to challenge and, and and see where they can create positive impact because uh, it's sometimes re quite yeah, narrow. I think, I think so. I think I've never met any manager or CEO that is not open to new opportunities if the work gets done. So what happens most of the time is that if, if you're a designer, you have new ideas, you go to uh, whatever boss you have to brief that to and then you say, I've got this great idea and the boss only hears, I've got a lot of extra work on my table. So if you can show that you've done your work and you've got next to that new plans and you've brought it to a maybe also already a, a proof of concept or some sort of prototype, be it a, a drawing or, or, or a first uh, paper model that shows what the possibilities are, then nobody will, will uh, um, um, hold you back. If it really creates the value that the company needs, apart from what the design brief said, they will listen to you, I think. And, and why do you think that the current designer of, of Happy Meals is not asking those questions? Why is that person not challenging his boss to do it differently? Probably not interested. You think so? Is it yeah, I think, yeah um, well, I think in, in, in sustainability especially, we've spent a lot of time in creating awareness and the idea that awareness equals action. And that's not the case. I think at this point everybody's aware of 
uh, global warming, the bigger challenges we're, we're facing, the SDGs. I think we're sort of aware of that, but that doesn't mean that you know per se that you're the person who is also responsible for creating the change. I think it's, it's, it's as a designer, everything that we see around us, everything in the built environment is at some point designed consciously or unconsciously. And, and once again, rediscovering that you as a designer have that profession and have that power. If you as the designer of plastic toys at McDonald's say, I'm not going to do this, then they need to find someone else to do it. But if you at that point can give a better solution or a better example and show how that can create a bigger value than just a plastic toy, I think that's when you're doing your job as a designer. It's showing your creativity. Do you agree yeah. with that? Yeah, and I, I also think that um, um, being really aware of what kind of material, so more material knowledge becomes more uh, relevant nowadays. Uh, a lot of people even don't know that there are different kind of plastics and what the effect of it is. Um, and that's also something we always try to do, that we really try to think from the material and, and um, also give that a place in a, in a certain context uh, or relate that to also you know, to the storytelling in an early stage of the design. Um, so and how can you incorporate that with storytelling? Well, I think if you go back to the, to the context, that is like design is storytelling in a way. Um, it's, 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 it's sort of portraying a message and, and, and getting people to like your product by storytelling. Um, so I think the, the two go closely, uh, closely related. Yeah? On one hand, the, the more technical aspect and, and, and thinking from materials and closing loop and so on. On the other hand, also yeah, incorporating people and getting people enthusiastic for this, for this story. Um, so I think, yeah, they're, they're closely related. Yeah, I think if you, if you look back at uh, the, the stuff you liked as a kid, you will rarely remember every single detail of the material in the production, but you'll remember the stories and the adventures you had with your toys. So you remember the experience of the product, not the product itself, and that's what you should design for uh, as a designer, is, is the experience and the interaction with the materials rather than just the thing. And can, can you guys, like one of you, give me an example of that? Like what is a good story of a product? Maybe something from the Better Future Factory? <laughs> now, um, for example, like we, one of the, the started we run is with um, 3D printing filament that we make. And what we, this is an example. So one of the so this resources... So 3D print filament. This is yeah. what goes into the machine. Into the machine. Yes. Yeah. And then from a recycled resource, it's made from car dashboards. And we uh, explicitly chose to keep it in a black color so that uh, the, the link to the car dashboard is still really strong. So people are not only just printing an object, but this used to be a car dashboard. And now it's a vase or a gear of, of something. So it is, it, the, the story behind it is much more powerful than just a piece of plastic. I think that's one of the ways we try to sort of um, yeah, get the story over. And these other ones, where are they made of? <laughs> They're all different. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we make them from PET bottles, different colors. Um, the green, the blue, and the transparent. This one is an interesting one. It's made from the inside of refrigerators, disposed uh, refrigerators. Um, it's a material we're going to launch uh, anytime soon. And this one is made from old food packaging. So we really, yeah, this one is maybe a bit vague because food packaging is not always white, but this is definitely the color of the inside of a, of a yes. refrigerator. Yeah. So we really try to keep this link. Uh, closely to the to the product it used to be. So, yeah, and can you also see it in a printed um, uh, object that you can see? Okay, this used to be the inside of the refrigerator, or um, is it just the color and the texture? Well, it's, it's the color, but it's also, the, for example, the storytelling that we do in, in what we try to do in our in our marketing. Uh, so by by making uh, certain movies about it. Um, for example, with this one, we have a complete episode how it's made in each and every step uh, from, from, from refrigerator all the way to a uh, 3D printed uh, prosthetic uh, hand. Um, so again, yeah, really about the, the, the storytelling from, from A to Z. Yeah. And do you have a good example about storytelling in one of the products that you um, designed? Well, I, I actually used their, their filament in a, in a theater show I'm, I'm running right now. And, and like you say, it's, it's just it's a very good slogan. If you can, if you can create a, a prosthetic hand, like you say, and say, this used to be a car dashboard, you automatically understand why this is relevant. It's much easier than if you say, this is just some sort of oil derivative, and then the product itself is the most important part. But um, I think it's really about the narrative that you create and how you engage people with that narrative and how you create a red thread. And then once again, show that it can be from, from uh, 
very much a peer-to-peer -peer or, or, or uh, individual based up until scale-ups and, 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 and uh, bigger companies and that you can be in every single facet if you want and you can just pick one of these, these possible futures and, and interact with it. So storytelling is important. What other skills are important for designers to develop if they want to develop for positive impact? Um, well, as a, as a designer, you need, need to be very curious or always sort of on the lookout for, for new things. And I think that's something uh, that both of us definitely yeah, have. Absolutely. Um, but it is also something with, with, if you look at education again, that you sort of have to trigger and to facilitate this curiosity, this, this sort of uh, urge to start experimenting, for example, with different materials. It's also something. Um, so, uh, yeah, giving, giving room to, to uh, experimenting is also, I think, an, an important aspect. So you also created something for in the classroom, right? You brought um, one yeah, of the yeah, yeah, tools. Yeah, <laughs> another tool. <laughs> no, um, we work a lot together with, with, with schools and other educational uh, um, institutions. And an um, assignment we often give is like, how can you drive one LED? And what I really like is then that 3D printing comes together with, with, other, with other pieces. Because like, if you look in the world around you, like 3D printed objects are yeah, only made of, of, of plastic. Um, or with this kind of uh, 3D printing. But in the normal world, hardly any product is just made of plastic, like no, a functional product. Um, so what I really like in this, in this case is that they start combining functional elements and it's not, uh, not just a vase, but it's something that really does something and it also uses the, the, uh, the power of 3D printing. Eh? So the, the rotor blade. Is, um, yeah, so so, so students um, had to develop something yeah. um, uh, with 3D printing. Yeah. And this was helpful because they they were curious or like well it touches different uh, different uh, subjects on one end they, they started really thinking as a designer yeah, how to how to drive one led and they came up with all kinds of solutions um also even uh, driven by water power or solar power and uh, the other hand they sort of get into contact with te technique and the other hand they were also thinking about sustainability so how can we drive this led in a sort of a sustainable way what kind of age was this this is uh, the last year of high school and the first year, uh, no, the first years of high school and the last years of elementary school. Okay, yeah. so that's about 12 years old yeah, and yeah. they are already 3D yeah. printing. Yeah, would you look at that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even great. coding uh, with the 3D printer. Yeah. yeah? yeah. And um, you are also involved in education. Yeah. What do you think is the most important skill to develop in education? Well, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of, of curiosity and, and wonderment. And I think that if you teach kids the tools, like for example, 3D printing, you should always keep them aware that the tool is a tool. It's a means, it's not a goal. So if it helps you in creating what you want to create, use it. If it doesn't, don't. And, and always, it's, it's the same question as you should ask when you're a designer of McDonald's. It's the same question you should ask in class is, why should I make this? And the moment you've you, you, you rephrased whatever the assignment was and you then created your own thing, then the teacher knows that you got it, uh, regardless of what you're making at that point. I think if it's, a, if it's a class that is purely about do you know how to use a 3D printer, that's learning a skill, but if it's really about applying those skills and being creative with it, it's about challenging, should I even use this? And if so, then use it in the correct way. So challenging your design brief storytelling and curiosity. Yeah? yeah. Um, before we go on to part two of this um, diff episode, we are first going to hear from uh, my colleague Vicky about what kind of diff sessions are coming up and what kind of diff sessions she recommends to watch already on Diff on Demand. Um, so off to you, Vicky. Thanks, Emma. Um, so a great session so far. Um, keep, stay curious. And McDonald's, if you're watching, redesign the Happy Meal. Um, so three sessions uh, that I would recommend watching. The first one is with Alicia Garmelovic. And she was looking at um, sort of the biggest revolution in 3D printing is yet to come. So she's looking at how we can create a future where anyone, anywhere can make things with abundant materials. So that's using things like cactus, bone, coral, plankton in 3D printers. So if you're interested in how we create water bottles out of algae, you know, bags out of gelatin, um, bioplastics from coffee, co coffee and potatoes, then this is the session for you. Um, another session that's actually coming up, so 
Alicia's session is, with, is on uh, Diff On Demand. You can watch it any time, obviously straight after this session if you're, if you're um, keen. Um, and so a session that's coming up by Ken Yang um, is at 11 o'clock on Wednesday and he's been named the top in the top 50 people who could save the planet with, by The Guardian. Um, and it's, it's called Designing the Regenerative City. Um, he's said, no one can create better than nature. And we'll be talking about how we can create a city that is as vibrant and as healthy as a forest. And my third recommendation is tomorrow at five. And we've got two designers, Leonard and Paul, um, who are going to talk about basic income and how the circular economy will finance it. Um, so they're my top three picks. And as I said, um, you can catch up on everything on Diff On Demand. So if you're not free at a specific time, just check them out on the website. And please do, you know, ask us questions on hashtag Think Diff and, um, you know, comment in the comment section under the videos on the session pages too. But yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Um, and now on to part two of this session we will play a little game. Uh, we're gonna play fact or fiction. And to start this off, um, Colin made a surprise jingle for us. So let's play the jingle. It is Emma got a dilemma. So listen to it closely and don't do nothing. Okay, um, <laughs> let's start fact or fiction <laughs> number one. Um, so um, we have a fact and a fiction in each of these statements. Um, and we have to determine which one is the fact and which one is the fiction. So here it says 30% of the replaced televisions uh, in uh, 2012 were still functioning or 60% of them were still functioning. So these, um, this is about the televisions that were replaced. How many of them were still functioning when they were replaced? What do we think? 30% or 60%? I would say even higher. But, higher? Um, yeah, then I'd go for 60. I would also go for 60. Yes, 60%. Yeah. That's the right one. Um, so the next one is the equivalent of one full truck of plastic ends up in our ocean every minute or um, in every five minutes? I think they're both horrible, so I, I'm hoping for horrible, five. Eh? I, yes. I hope for five. Uh, I, uh, you, you know the answer, know you the made answer, this yeah. one. What is the answer? It's every one minute. Yes, yeah. every one minute. This is, this is designs that designers make that end up in yeah. landfill and oceans. I actually found a really interesting um, startup. It's called the, the Bubble Barrier, mm -hmm. and they are now doing a pilot to kind of <coughs> prevent plastic from getting into the ocean by creating like walls of bubble mm -hmm. um, uh, in like, like um, rivers. Right. Yeah, rivers yeah. Um, to prevent it actually from getting to the ocean yeah. and to s keep it close to the source. But still, we like. It's an yeah. awful lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's an awful lot. <laughs> Next one. Okay, so the Club of Rome in 1972, they forecasted that zinc would run out. Would it run out in 18 years or 70 years? What do you think? Ooh. So this is in 1972. Mm. 18 years or 70 years? I reckon 18. Yeah, I would go for 18. It was 18 years, but we still have zinc. Yeah. And that is because technology developed so quickly. Um, that we are much more like we need zinc less it's, and less. Mm -hmm. um, it's also because it became very expensive. Yeah. And so there were a lot of recycling programs. Yeah, and also that people started using them less, yep. recycling programs, like the value increased. Um, so we still, actually, a couple of years ago, we still forecast that we would have 18 years left. Mm -hmm. cool. um, so it's interesting how technology can develop. Um, yes, next one, a final one. Um, so nature designs everything from three polymers or from five polymers. Ooh, I go for three. Three? Then I'll go for five. Okay, <laughs> so the right answer is five polymers. Um, this is also uh, highlighted in one of the sessions from Alicia, uh, one of the sessions that Vicky just highlighted. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are um, cellulose, uh, lignin, chitin, pectin, and hemicellulose. Um, and 
Um, this is also the next topic that I would like to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, because Alicia talked in her diff session um, a week ago about 3D printing and um, natural materials. And I would like to talk about that with you um, now as well. But let's first have a look at a short clip from her session. We are rapidly moving towards a world where more people in more places have the tools and the knowledge to fabricate things. And the key missing part of that, I believe, for that world of, of fabrication, which is rapidly moving um, in a, an accelerating direction, is, is what material palette we use. Um, and so this talk is all about reinvigorating and tapping into the materials we have around us that are abundant and thinking about how digital fabrication can make use of these ingredients to build fantastic things and how pretty much anyone uh, on the planet now ha is going to be able to have these tools at their fingertips and what that means for the future of fabrication and the future of manufacturing and the future of the circular economy is incredibly exciting. So we already briefly talked about um, natural materials and 3D printing, um, uh, but what is your point of view on this? Because we just um, also see that like um, the, the, the um, car parts mm -hmm. in, in 3D printing filaments um, is something that works well in, in the storytelling and design for positive impact. Um, do you think that we will ever shift towards doing something like this, but then with natural resources? Yeah, I definitely think so. But it de depends um, if it is the right system. Um, I think if, for example, look, uh, one of the materials used a lot in 3D printing is a PLA. So it's a yeah, bio-based um, polymer. Um, Biodegradable as well? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so for, for, um, for some products, it, yeah, for example, if you print a vase, it could be a perfect material. But if you think about uh, if, you, if it's a part of a 3D printer, I would suggest then go for a, yeah, a polymer that isn't biodegradable because it needs to last longer. Um, so but what if that ends up in a waste, like what if a natural material ends up in a waste stream for um, like a petrochemical plastic? Mm -hmm. um, and if they're being confused, like... Yeah. That, that's one of the barriers and new challenges at the moment, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the main problem. I think with, if you look, for example, at, at PLA, that there's not a system yet in place to recycle PLA. So what happens is a PLA ends up with um, oil-based plastics. And um, for example, um, if, they, if they get burned to generate the uh, heat, um, the waste treatment uh, plants hate PLA because it doesn't burn that well. So you get angry waste treatment. Um, and you have a, a, a product that isn't uh, recycled in the way it should be. So it doesn't work yet because the system isn't in place. Um, what kind of system do we need to get in place for that? Um, well, I think a, a system that, um, it, on one hand, it's also for the consumer that he can understand in, in what system certain waste streams have to be. If you now look at a plastic, you don't know like what kind of plastic, especially if it's a if it's a biodegradable plastic. You don't you don't see it from the outside, but you you have to know it's a it's a biodegradable plastic. Um, so there's yeah. On one hand, we should educate um, the people, but on the other hand, we should also make it a bit more easy for them because you don't want to do a complete research before you throw something away. Alicia um, uh, mentioned that she thinks that we will eventually go into the world where everything will be. Um, uh, based on natural materials. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the two will coexist, like petrochemical and like synthetic materials uh, next to natural materials and products? Or do you think that we will eventually move towards a world where everything would be natural? Um, I th um, yeah, that's a good question. I think, it's, uh, I think it will co be a combination of the two, to be honest, mm -hmm. uh, because petrochemics have such yeah, unique qualities that, that can't be tipped yet by, by biopolymers, in my opinion. Mm. But it could also be a transition. So who knows that we, in 50 years, we do have biopolymers that, that do have the same properties as, uh, um, um, yeah, as oil-based. And, and Jan, we also had a quick chat about the, if we use more, um, like, for example, plant-based mm -hmm. or, or um, natural materials, that it might pressure agriculture or... Um, yeah, that, that's one of the biggest concerns, like with the PLA, it's, it's cornstarch. So yeah. um, 
And there's this big question on whether or not we should use. But you're not concerned about that, right? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not too concerned about it. No, I think, I think that the two will coexist for a while, but in the end, I think um, even if we go to a fully circular uh, economy, you still have an outfall of material. So you will have to shift at some point to renewable energies or start with asteroid mining, taking that really seriously. Um, but I think if we, if we look then at, at if we use, if we want to replace all the plastic and all the oil derivatives with polymers and with uh, natural products, then you need a lot of land. And then I think the biggest shift is not so much in having the discussion on what we should use the land for, but the discussion should we still need the traditional romantic vision of what agriculture is. Because you can very uh, efficiently uh, produce in, in food farms and use aquaponics and don't use land. And you can go in three dimensions instead of just using one layer of land and that's the only uh, surface that you have for, for uh, culturing plants and, and growing stuff. So I think that we, we can do this. And then, then if you look at the bigger picture, for example, there's going to be a lot of parking spots in cities that are going to be empty because no more cars are allowed into a city. Or if you have self-driving cars, you have much, uh, a, a, a big decrease in, in the, the amount of cars that are driving around in cities. So just use all those spaces that aren't used for anybody else anymore and start stacking up uh, farms in there. Thank both for you. food and for, for materials. Yeah. And then it's local and then you can really start creating this, this very localized, very decentralized and very uh, um, user-focused production and, 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 and agriculture system. Do you think that mindset of, of local using abundant materials, do you think that that is much in the minds of designers or do you think that they're currently much more in the mindset of using petrochemical plastics and, and metals and, um, and doing that on a large scale, economies of scale. Um, what do you guys think? I think that you know, designers use what they, what they know um, and what they're familiar with. And, um, so if they're not into, the, uh, in, into biopolymers, it's something um, they, yeah, and actually, I think they should investigate, but not all designers will, yeah. because they're comfortable with what, they're, what they've been doing for a while. Um, and therefore, it's so important that already in, in the design education that, that students start experimenting with materials. And that's why I also wanted, I think one of the really interesting talks was with um, um, Mette Andersson, was about the Material Design Lab, was one of the talks about a week ago. And I think that was a, a very good example of that they have a material library in place in the university where you have hundreds of different samples where you can sort of get lost and get inspired. And next to that, they have a really tangible way of, of playing and experimenting with, with different biopolymers, but also other polymers and other materials. So really in a low threshold, students get sort of get involved in using different materials. And I think that was really an yeah, inspirational example. And I also think that, that Right now, the, the current generation of designers isn't really looking into that, but more and more student designers are really asking themselves, should I use this material? And spending more time on defining what material they should use or shouldn't use than on the final form giving of the, the product or the assignment, which I think is very interesting. Um, there's this, this course at the University of Ghent right now that the designers are having that they're working with mycelium, so with the, the roots of, of uh, mushrooms and growing products out of that just to get a hold on there's other stuff than just printing or, or using a vacuum former or just using uh, whatever oil derivative that you can find. So I think that the shift is coming, but it, it's sort of a, a demand versus uh, question, uh, uh, the demand versus uh, what, what's being auctioned in, in the market because... And, and where does the demand need to come from? Well, I think it's, it's always this... this, this um, this is this big difficulty because product, uh, producers won't start producing these materials if nobody asks for them. And nobody will ask for them if they don't know that they can exist. So that's why I think that this big shift from materials will probably not come in the first place from the material producers, but from fab labs and from uh, open space, bio labs and stuff like that, where people are actively looking into what plants, what materials, what bacteria can we use to grow other stuff and then show that stuff in a once again, via storytelling and a very good product or a very good service or a very good story that people show, yeah, I want this as well. Who can give me this on a larger scale? And that's the moment when the, the manufacturers probably will chip in. 
Um, we have a few questions coming in from the audience. All right. And um, Peter, he challenges uh, your vision uh, on the ThinkDiff web website. And what he says is, I don't think it's fair to say that some designers don't care um, about environmental issues. Um, he used to work for a large corporation and he had very little opportunity to challenge those, those questions and those design briefs. Um, do you guys both have like some advice for people in uh, both in-house but also working for design agencies that need to challenge design briefs and that feel that they don't have that much opportunity for that? I think part of the solution was in that question. Is he used to work for. <laughs> if you if you really go. yeah if you if you really don't have that opportunity and you really care about it then you probably won't stay there. I think. But then another designer comes in and he does the job for you, yeah, creating negative you should do, impact. As a designer that left, you should do a better job for the competitor and show them who was right. So leaving is an option. What do you think, Kasper? Um, yeah, leaving is an option. I think also if you go back to, to um, taking the context in, into account, so coming, <laughs> come up with a better story that they, you do get people enthusiastic within the company to sort of carry your message. So maybe it shouldn't be a, a, a one-man uh, show then, but try to see other, if other people are also interested in the same goal and then see if you can, yeah. Uh, There's also the, the, you have the design part and, and creating that story and, and depending on where you are in the hierarchical ladder, it can be really difficult to really sell that. Yeah. And on the other hand, you have the, the non-hierarchical part where you can, if, if the boss goes and plays tennis on Saturday, just be at the tennis club or if he is influenced by someone else in the company, go influence that other guy. It's really about knowing the, the psychology of inception, basically. If it's in, in any company that has a hierarchical structure, in the end, the boss needs to have the idea. But that's just playing the uh, politics game. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, but yeah. if it works, it works, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, th my, I think also getting, people, like, getting someone uh, excited for marketing. Mm -hmm. So g get them along in the story yeah. and, and tell them more about yeah. circle economy. Get them, I think because to a large extent, they will be really interested in this, but they just didn't hear of it in, before that. So try to get them, uh, yeah, enthusiastic for the same f for the same cause. And then if you sort of collaborate on this, you will have a much stronger case. Yeah. yeah. And the same for salespeople. Yeah. If you find some people from sales who come up with, we have these and these and these customers asking for this, then R&D will follow, will have to follow. Yeah. And, and what, just to, because we're almost running out of time, but um, what, what does positive impact will, what, what does it look like? Um, do we talk about like the environment? Um, is your focus much more on social outcome of positive impact? Or if you, if you design a product for positive impact, what kind of positive impact does it have? Mm, like for us, the standard is always that we look at like, is this something for the, for the better future? Um, and Although it's difficult to measure, we try to put it in words nowadays. Um, but is it something that is useful for future generations? Um, and I think that's also maybe close, closer related uh, to the statement of what is a, what's a sustainable development. But um, is this something that yeah, really future generations can continue on and doesn't, is, isn't a, a negative impact? Um, yeah. And what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I think that. Um, you can have a very utopian and a very dystopian circular economy. And I think if your focus is purely on the materials and the, the transactions of those materials, and you don't keep in account the, the social aspect of what an economy should do, which is to support a community. And the more we go global, the more the community becomes global. If your product and your design and your companies don't do that, then a circular economy might be sustainable and we might not die because of scarcity but that doesn't mean that we have a high well-being at that point. Yeah, so also that well-being aspect. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. 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 Um, I think we're running out of time. <laughs> um, let's wrap up with the last um, question. Tell me in 30 seconds, the future of design needs to be dot, 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 dot. So who wants to start first? Oof. The future of design needs to be... And the future of design needs to be, I think, um, you know, sp spark curiosity should be inclusive. So, a lot, yeah, include a lot of different people um, and should be a positive one. Um, so, yeah, a smarter one as well. 
Yeah, also going for, for inclusive and, and always in beta, always evolving. It's never a fixed point, it's mm -hmm. always fluent. Inclusive design. Um, let's, let's finish on that one. Thank you so much for coming to our studio. Thank you. Thank the you. vibrant cows on the Isle of Wight. <laughs> um, for all the designers that are watching, we have many sessions on the diff that are just something that you must watch. And therefore we made a playlist for you, the eight must watch sessions for designers. And this session is um, uh, one of those. Um, so if you go to the diff website and you go to the top nav, you find playlists and just look on the second row and there you find playlists for designers. Um, we have a really interesting session coming up soon after this one in 45 minutes with Hunter Lovins about regenerative um, um, economics um, and she is the president of um, Natural Capitalism Solutions and also a friend of the foundation. So I'm definitely going to watch that session and hopefully see you there. Have a good day.